Okay. The thing about Locke is that his epistemology, at least, is, is a bit dull. It's not weird, like Plato and Kant. And I think the reason that Locke's epistemology is dull is because it's pretty darn sensible. Um, Locke seems pretty ordinary to us, but that's because we live in a cognitive world um, in with an academic background that's largely founded on the work of John Locke. So he was the guy who figured out a lot of stuff that we already take for granted. And um, as I was sitting here this morning, I had an idea uh, of how to characterize the transition from rationalist epistemology like Plato and Descartes to more modern empiricist epistemology, um, starting with Locke. And I'm going to call this uh, the transformation of truth. forever and it will be that thing forever. But our ideas of what truth is, our understanding of what truth is, changed profoundly between Descartes and Locke. But Descartes different idea of truth. <laughs> Locke, and the people who come, most of the people who come after him, Truth is our best guess. We may believe that there is a real world with real properties. And those real properties, whatever they are, uh, are absolute certainties. That the real world really has those properties. There is a way the world is. But modern epistemology says we can't know it. We cannot have certain knowledge of this. We can just have our best guess. Now, we think that our best guess is pretty good. In fact, we may have 99.9999999% confidence in our best guess, but we never have 100%. Now, 
big difference. A big difference between these two views is Descartes' view, the certainty view, is we don't need a heuristic rule. We don't need a rule to choose between competing uh, uh, explanations. There's the right theory. There's the right explanation. All the other explanations, all the other theories are wrong. We don't need a rule to choose that. We just choose the right explanation. In Locke's theory, when we're going with our best guess, we do need a rule. uncertain explanations. We need a rule to pick between Copernican and Ptolemaic astronomy, because we don't know which one is absolutely right. Both of them could be wrong. Both could be right. Both could be wrong. How do we pick? And we end up using Occam's razor. Razor. Why do we use Occam's razor? Because we need a rule, and this is the best one we can think of. Are we absolutely certain that Occam's razor is the best rule? No, we're not. <laughs> we're not absolutely certain of anything anymore. Why don't we go with Plato and Descartes? because it didn't work. Descartes was one of the smartest men in history, and he could not make rationalism work. A couple of people came in. I'm just going to call a couple of names. Nicole Bogus. Brian Burke, Marissa Canlis, uh, Michelle Casso, Sarah Chang, Andrew Choi, we are here already. John Chumman, uh, Val Dow, uh, Victoria Dixon, Michelle Milchol, Jerome, Jerome Junko, Christopher Gutierrez, Daniel Hernandez, Joseph Hiesel, Caleb, Jason, Roger Lee, Daniel Larigo, Corey Mandrick, Mark Motol, Sylvia Nava, Joseph Negrete, Ashley Oates, I think that's everybody. Martin or Stephanie, anyone call, any Rodriguez at all? Uh, Eric, John, Mel no, Charles. Okay, so this is what happens. This was it. This is what happened. The rationalist project basically failed, and something had to be put in its place. 
And Locke is the guy who came up with the best replacement. This, this view of truth, this way of deciding between competing theories, to the problem of knowledge. What is knowledge? Where does knowledge come from? How do we get knowledge? Plato and Descartes said, basically, they can't come from experience, so they must be innate. This is complicated. This is actually a very complicated theory, because it it raises a bunch of questions. If our ideas are innate, how do they get into the mind? How do they become innate? You know, they were, this, this idea was in your mind before you were born. Well, how can an idea be in my mind before I'm born? How could my mind exist before I'm born? So. some kind of elaborate system of magic, of uh, boogie-boogie, uh, supernatural stuff, stuff that can't be uh, physical. Well, how come? Okay. Now, all of this is logically possible. There's no logical problem with believing in this stuff. We're not, these things are not logically self-contradictory. And we have the evidence of knowledge to justify this, right? Descartes' argument for the existence of God, Plato's argument for the existence of the world of forms as a real thing, uh, all depend on the evidence, on one piece of evidence. And that piece of evidence is we have ideas. Ideas exist.
Descartes' argument, Plato's argument is, look, people have ideas. These ideas cannot come from experience, therefore they must be innate. argument is the idea, is the claim that ideas cannot come from experience. Experience is uncertain. You can't be getting ideas from experience. The slave boy could not have learned the idea, the solution to the square doubling problem. It must have been innate. When we did that argument, when we talked about the slave boy argument, we pointed out that the slave boy sure as hell could have figured that out as he went along. There's another explanation. So the slave boy argument fails to prove that ideas are innate. Descartes' argument depends on the claim that ideas cannot come from these unreliable senses. If Locke can show how ideas can come from experience, he will refuse Plato and Descartes. He'll prove them wrong. provide a working theory. All he has to do is provide a theory of knowledge that allows knowledge to come from experience, and he will prove Plato wrong. He will prove Descartes wrong. All he has to do is to come up with a theory that works and he'll prove Plato wrong. And the reason the mere existence of this theory will prove Plato wrong is because if he does, Occam's razor Occam's razor will make it the right theory. it has fewer entities. That's the key here. All Locke has to do is to provide a working theory. If we believe in Occam's razor, that will make his theory correct if it is the one with fewer entities. And it will be. Because the innate ideas theory has lots of un unobservable entities. All he has to have is minds.
This is Locke's theory of knowledge. Minds exist. He assumes that minds exist. That's his entity. And minds have the ability to take impressions of ideas from outside, from experience. There are no forms, there is no God, there are um, no magic ways of imprinting. It's just sensory impressions. Plato's theory has the same thing. Descartes' theory has the same thing. And it has more. Descartes and Plato's theory have more entities. So by Occam's razor, this is definitely the simplest theory. This will work, this will win, if it fits the facts. two kinds of ideas. There's two kinds of impression the mind can have. You can get them from experience. A simple idea is an idea that can be gotten from experience alone. The idea of yellow, the idea of rectangular, um, no, the idea of airy. A simple idea is an idea that you can communicate to someone else by holding up an object. In fact, it's very hard to see uh, idea without giving an experience. Heavy versus light. I don't know. I guess I could describe that. Sometimes only from experience. So, imagine trying to communicate the concept of red without showing someone a red thing. Imagine um, a space colony or something where there's nothing red. <coughs> and you make a little village up in the mountains and you take nothing red up there. You never make red paint, nothing is painted red. You don't take red markers or red pens, red cars, nothing red. And you raise some kids there, and they never experience the color red. Now imagine that you dress all in green as a missionary, say, and you go up and you try to explain the concept of red to these kids, and you have no red items. Say you're hiking and you come across this little valley. And somehow, in all your pockets, you have nothing red. How do you explain the concept of red? Because of it. 
when they're slapping stuff up. Okay, can you do it without showing them something red? Okay, you're a Martian. You're green. <laughs> so you're green. You're completely green. You're Kermit the Frog, and you're trying to explain red to these people. Muppets. Let's make them Muppets. I don't know why. Um, right. But if it comes from only from experience, simple ideas are ideas that can come only from experience. So, and what other kinds of ideas are complex ideas. There are other kinds of ideas. Ideas that are not simple ideas, logical and complex ideas. They are ideas that you get by combining simple ideas. In Locke's theory, every complex idea can eventually be broken down into a set of simple ideas. So for example, an aircraft carrier. If you describe an aircraft carrier to someone, imagine describing an aircraft carrier to someone. You say, well, it's a big boat that carries airplanes. And well, what's a boat? What's an airplane? So you explain an airplane, and you break down all the parts of the airplane, and the little parts of boat, uh, and eventually, you say, well, look, a boat is something that floats. And you show them something floating. Like you can get that from experience. Your plane is something that flies. You throw something. So like that. And it doesn't fall down quite so quickly. Imagine that going on forever. Every part of the description can be broken down, eventually, can be broken down to some experience. Now what this does, if this works, it shows that any idea that exists can be shown to be fully dependent on experience. That it is a bunch of things that we have experienced. It's a combination of potential experiences. If there is even one idea that cannot be broken out, down into simple ideas, then Locke is wrong. If there's an idea that you cannot have ultimately gotten from experience, that it's impossible to get this idea from experience, Locke is wrong.
And if there isn't, he's right. He wins. If there's no such idea out there, he wins. So if you want to prove Locke wrong, you have to come up with an idea that cannot be broken down into simple ideas. You will have to come up with an idea that cannot be broken down into partial ideas that can be gotten from experience. And I, I invite you to try to think of one. It's an interesting mental exercise. That, as far as I can tell, there is no idea, no, no real thing, no fictional thing, no concept that cannot be broken down ultimately to experiences. We get our ideas from our experiences and mental operations on the idea, on other ideas that we got from experience. That's the whole of epistemology. That's why uh, Locke wins. So, This is why Locke's epistemology is significantly more than just a rather dull theory of ideas. It is also a massive boot to the head of rationalism. right in the head, or rather his epistemology kicks their epistemologies right in the head. Well, there's another metaphor I could have used involving Occam's razor. And how many of you have seen Sweeney Todd? with the rationalists. There's a question, how did these guys go wrong? And Locke's explanation for that, Locke's description of that, <coughs> was, well, they reified, they made real abstractions. They made abstractions into real things. An abstraction, well, an abstraction is, to say, a term like skinny. If you meet a bunch of people who are not fact, not even a little bit fact. You have the concept of skinny. Now, does skinny exist independent of people or independent of skinny things? It's a concept of long, something that's longer than it's wide. Does that exist independent of any long thing? Well, it exists as a concept. You can think of it. It's an idea. But that doesn't mean it's part of the universe. 
It's just potential. It's all on the table. Good. And good is a high level abstraction. It's the highest level of abstraction. We make judgments about things all the time. This is good. That's not good. This is good looking. That's not good looking. This tastes good. That doesn't taste good. Well, there's always the, there's the division between good and bad. Is that a feature of the universe? No. Well, Plato said it was. Um, Descartes thinks it's an innate idea put into his mind by God. Locke says, no, that's an abstraction. That's a concept we get by comparing experiences. We experience the world, and we come up with some ideas based on that. And then we find commonalities between those ideas. For instance, um, beauty and palatability. Right? So that looks good. This tastes good. This feels good. We have a class of good things. Some people get some things get in there by sounding good. Some things get in there by feeling good, by tasting good, by looking good. What do they have in common? Well, the thing they have in common is a way we react to them. We go, hmm, nice. Instead of, I like. That's what puts all the, all the good things into one. Uh, basket our reaction to those things. It's not something they have intrinsically. It's not a metaphysical quantity. the idea innately, you could not recognize the quality in the world. That is, in order to recognize something as good, you have to have already have the idea of good in your, uh, in your background, in your mind. Well, think about that. Um, imagine someone who can't tell good from bad, good things from bad things. He can't tell what he likes from what he dis dislikes. He can't tell uh, a good looking thing from a bad looking thing, a good tasting thing from a bad tasting thing. Well, we can imagine someone like that. We kind of imagine it like a mental disease. But does that mean we have to have the concept in our minds already in order to distinguish between good and bad? No, it just means that this guy, for him, there is no good or bad. Nothing is good to him. Nothing is. Good. Have you ever had a time in your life where nothing seemed to matter, where you just sort of didn't care about stuff, like you were really depressed, or you just had the blahs, and people say, "Let's go do this. Let's go do that," and just nothing sounds good. Well, at that point in life, nothing is good. Not for you. Good and bad only have meaning relative to human beings. Then there's big and small. And I wish I had a big thing and a small thing to call it about. Okay. Smaller than. That's an abstraction, right? Or, or higher than. Is it really true that 
we could not know that the cup is bigger than the pen without having that idea. How do we know bigger than? We know bigger than by experiencing objects. Some objects are bigger than the other. Uh, the, uh, sorry. We have experiences of some objects that we feel them being more intrusive on us, taking up more of the space around us. And we have experience of other objects taking up less space. In terms of clothing, there's clothing we can get into and clothing that we can't. Right? I was once skinny enough to fit into um, size 34 pants. And the other day I found that I stood in my wardrobe. I was size 34 pants. And it was funny trying, watching me, to watch me try to get into them. So, we have all of these things can be attributed to experience. This idea that if you didn't already have the idea and you could not recognize it in the world is rubbish. That's complete and utter crap. You don't need to have any ideas. So, here's the thing. As far as I can tell, there is no idea out there that cannot be ultimately broken down to simple ideas that can be directly experienced. When you take something as complicated as, an, as the Olympics, right, uh, or an aircraft carrier, interstellar battleship, dragon, well, dragon may be simple. Um, it may be tedious to break it down all the way. The thing may be very, very, very complicated. The National Baseball thing, whatever it is. Major League Baseball? MLB. Sorry? Major League Baseball. Oh, MLB. Okay, Major League Baseball. Big and complicated. Take a while to break every part of it down to simple ideas. I may not be able to do it in, my, uh, in what's left of my lifetime, but it can be done. For the, for the rationalists to have a real uh, reply, they have to show an idea that cannot be gotten from experience. And they can't do that. So, There are two competing rules of thought, two competing rules for determining the truth. There was Descartes' method of doubt, which basically said, believe only certainties. Then there's Occam's razor, which says, believe the most simple explanation that fits the facts. Believe the most simple explanation that fits the facts versus believe only things that are certain. Occam's razor wins. Believe only certainties fails. Okay. Believe only certainties fails as a rule of logic. We don't get knowledge out of it. If that is our rule of knowledge, a rule for deciding truth versus falsity, a rule for deciding what we know and what we don't, for generating knowledge, for explaining knowledge. It fails miserably. 
The Kant's elaborate uh, argument collapses very quickly when it's pushed logically. So, Occam's razor is, is a fundamental part of the modern world. It's a fundamental part of modern uh, cognitive economy. Science is based on Occam's razor. Academia, academic thought, history, geography, they're all based on Occam's razor. Any kind of useful thought out there, any kind of thought that actually tells you something about the real world is based on Occam's razor. So, as far as I'm concerned, Locke's epistemology kicks ass. His ontology needs work. It's, it's, it's a pretty good start, but it needs work. Okay. exist and have qualities. Okay. There's no such thing as substance. There is no thing metaphysically under this pen. This pen is just here as an object that exists in the world. There's no metaphysics. There's just physics. What exists are objects. Nothing fancy. These objects have qualities. They have primary qualities which are in the object themselves. which are in the objects themselves. The object's weight, its shape, its extension. Secondary qualities are different for luck. For luck, a secondary quality is a quality that appears in, the mind, in our mind in response to a power held by the object. Thank you. 
where Bloch said, Bloch, Bloch's analysis of color would be like this. Yeah, we know that this object, this lectern, has shape. Right? See this lectern? It has a particular shape, it has hardness, um, it has a certain oh, weight. Um, but as for its color, what the object has in it is the ability to make us experience color when we look at it. And the reason Locke believes this is that the color of this object can look different to different observers. Different people can, can, bring, can experience different colors when looking at this object. Now, the most striking example to me of uh, a secondary of, uh, uh, a secondary quality is taste and smell. Have you ever had someone, have you ever smelled something that other people didn't smell or detected a taste in something that other people don't notice, don't taste? No? Yeah. Thank you. Good. Okay. I thought I was off on a limb there. What, am I the only one? Um, to how many people in this room does celery have a very pungent, striking flavor? Celery. Celery, the crunchy stuff. Yeah. Me too. I like it. You like it? Yeah, but... Sure, good. A lot of people like it. I hate it. I loathe celery. I cannot stand to eat things that have noticeable celery in them. And I will usually notice the celery. Um, the juice of, celery, juice of fresh celery has a taste to me that's something like weed killer. It is foul. Uh, and, and for decades, I believed it tasted that way to everyone. And then my daughter says, well, yeah, like I said, it's going to be sort of bland. It doesn't have much taste. But what do you mean it doesn't have much taste? It's, it's vile, it's the most pungent taste there is. Celery? No, it's got a mild taste. Oh, well, no wonder I'm weird. No wonder nobody else goes absolutely crazy when they find celery in a sandwich. So, just think how people were looking at me, weeding out of it. Weeding out of the celery? What? So, uh, things can taste differently to us. So Locke explains that as saying, celery has the power to evoke flavor, but that flavor will be different in different people. So it's like the same input produces different outputs depending on the reception system. So there's something in us that responds to secondary qualities or secondary quality powers. And each of us, each of us has a different, there's variation in that. There's variation in our ability to respond to color. Now, well, this is actually kind of brilliant, if you think about it. Because what's coming out of that celery? What's coming out of that celery is flavor esters. It's complex organic molecules. And they go into our taste buds and they uh, they aerosolize and go up into the nasal uh, passages and our sense system and our taste system sample these chemicals and everyone's sensorium, everyone's ensemble of taste and scent receptors is different. I have different distribution of taste buds, different distribution of scent receptors than everyone else. Isn't that stuff the water? No, it's not just water, because it tastes bad. It's water plus flavor ingredients. If you don't taste them, good for you. I mean, it's great. I wish I didn't taste it. It's not you, but it's fine. No, I, it, I swear to God. It, it, it's like, take, 
take celery and, and dip it in something really nasty and pungent. Um, I cannot think of anything out there that tastes as nasty as celery does. So <laughs> use motor oil, right? You know, and, and that'll be something. You know, something like this. gasoline. Okay, soak it, soak some celery in gasoline, and then bite it, and you have some idea what it tastes like to me. Um, so we have these scent receptors, these taste receptors, and they respond differently. What's going on with the primary qualities? Well, let's put it this way. We have um, some, so a, a bunch of perfumes or aromat aromatic compounds, uh, fruits, fresh fruits, vegetables, uh, things that the things that smell, but nothing nasty, all right. Um, and we have a bunch of shapes and boxes and things of various weight. And we have, basically imagine a whole bunch of different things, each one of which is designed to appeal to various senses. Um, they have various properties, weight, texture. Which ones would we come to agreement about? Okay. For instance, there's two there's two identical cubes, except one's heavier than the other. How many of us would, if they, if they once noticeably heavier than the other, would we disagree about which one was heavier? No, we wouldn't. We'd each shake and say, okay, that one's the heavy one. Right? I can tell that. Now, when we come to tasting the celery, could we disagree about what it tasted like? If we have an object that's a, a particular complex color, like could we, would we all come to an agreement about what color it is? Yeah. Um, maybe not. Sometimes things are, you know, that, that looks green. Have you ever had something that looks green to you but brown to someone else? Blue to you or green to someone else? Colorblind. That's right, some people are colorblind. That's funny, colorblind people often don't know that they're colorblind. Um, in uh, the movie Little Miss Sunshine, uh, one of the characters wants to be an Air Force pilot and then finds out he's colorblind. He didn't know. Now, I don't know if that's real, but when they do colorblind testing, they don't ask people, can you see colors? We think we can. And then they show them this thing with the dots and this, what's the number? And most people say, well, nine or three or seven. And the colorblind people say, what number? Because the dots all look the same to them. So internal experience is, is different. So things that can be experienced differently by different people, their secondary qualities because there's a lot of processing that goes into representing that in the brain. But things that can be really easily come to experience, uh, come to agreement about, where we can really easily come to an agreement, like the mass of something, the shape, the hardness, right? We have objective mode. Do we have really objective measures of color, of taste, of smell? Um, we got there with color because we got wavelengths of light, right? But until we got wavelengths of light, of light, and to use color references, um, how did it blend? How, how did it decide on the flavors of wine? Is there a machine that you can put the wine in and it'll tell you what it tastes like? No, they have tasters. They have people who taste it. And, you know, ever been to a wine tasting or something? Um, you know why a bottle of, uh, of regular scotch tastes the same year after year after year? Because they have blenders who take all the, av the available whiskies and taste them to figure out how they combine and make it taste the same. They blend things together. So if it's something where you really need the human eye, the human senses, the, the taste, the smell, to really make discriminations, then it's going to be called a secondary quality. 
If it's something where you can easily settle on it, it's going to be a primary point. Um, now, the problem with Locke's thing is that he didn't know neuroscience. He didn't know about sensory processing. Right? He's the guy at the start of the um, process that leads to modern neuroscience. He had no freaking idea how information gets into the mind. All he did was say, let's say. All he did was assume that it comes from experience. Something is going on. Um, the earliest theory of optics, for instance, our modern theory of optics is that light is emitted by some light source, like fluorescent light, or the sun, whatever, um, and it flies through space, hits objects, some of it is absorbed, some of it is reflected, this light travels around, um, gets in our eyes, and um, stimulates our retinas, and from that, it's focused in the eye, stimulates the retina, and from that, we know what things look like. We form visual, we form visual impressions. In Locke's day, they had no idea about this. There was no idea that light was something that flew through the air, or that it was light flew from objects. They might think that light was coming out of the sun, but they really didn't think that light was coming back from people. What they thought was that something like rays, or like little long hands, probes, came out of the eye, touched, touched other people's faces, touched the things around them, and then reported back. So you can imagine it's like having the eyes closed and feeling your way around. There were all these feelers coming out of the eye, invisible, intangible, magical feelers. This seems ridiculous to us because we know there's nothing intangible and we know how sight works. But it wasn't ridiculous for the ancients because they didn't know the other stuff. They didn't know the stuff that made it wrong. Locke is starting us on this, but his theory is more than just not as complicated as ours. His theory is much more simple. There are primary qualities that are in objects, and there are secondary qualities that are in our minds, but provoked by powers in the objects. So that's where we are with Locke. We've got an explanation for how we get knowledge, and we've got an explanation for how objects have properties. Objects exist, they have properties, there's no such thing as substance. There's no, nothing metaphysical, objects exist in the world. That is a real world, and we live in it, and we experience it, and objects in that world have primary and secondary qualities. Okay, so any questions? Okay, uh, thanks to